Hello everybody and welcome to the first DCAP Ljubljana webinar. It's quite an interesting topic on information exchange and we hope that you will find it very useful and that you will also enjoy this unique opportunity that we have today. My name is Rogdar Rencin and I will be the moderator of this webinar. But before we get into the content, just a brief information about the GoToWebinar software. We have an interesting lineup for you today. We will start with Ms. Jelka Clements on the DCAF Border Security Program continue with Katarina Lednik on the PCC SCE, and then work our way towards information exchange, which will be presented by Mr. Dushan Karin. Following his presentation, we will have a Q&A session, so feel free to post any questions you might have to the questions shout box. Please note that you can post questions in English, Croatian, Serbian, and also in Bosnian. After the webinar, Please also stay connected a few moments more for a brief evaluation of the webinar and also suggestions. Now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Jelka Clements. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jelka Clements. I work at DKF Ljubljana, and my task today is to briefly present the border security program in the Western Balkans. This is a long-standing regional effort implemented for the last 12 years or so in the Western Balkan countries, five Western Balkan beneficiaries. Its target is to support cross-border operational cooperation between the border police forces in the Western Balkan region. And today, as um, irregular migration and accompanying forms of organized crime and terrorism pose a pressing threat to the region and Europe as a whole, Border cooperation and effective border management has never been so important. Information exchange, of course, is an important aspect for operational cooperation, also for border police forces, especially cross-border. And in the Western Balkan region, many challenges remain. Our program provides them with specific and concrete instruments, which may in the next years overcome these challenges, strengthen cooperation further, and speed up their progress on the way to EU and Schengen integration. Our program consists of three main components, operational cooperation, education and training, and EU integration and capacity building, including Schengen integration. And next to this, we have two horizontal components, irregular migration, where our, where our program plays, is one of the components, and uh, accompanying activities in the area of legal reform adapting legislation. Under component one, EU and Schengen integration, we are preparing our beneficiary countries to undertake responsibilities arising from EU and Schengen integration now in the pre-accession phase. It is the task of our so-called Schengen integration task force at expert level to bring together police, border police and ministry experts and transfer knowledge on Schengen, on novelties at the EU level, on important uh, instruments and, of course, to provide them information on where they are in this process today. We are evaluating their progress with the help of the so-called Schengen Self-Evaluation Module, an online application which regional experts use themselves and get input into where they are in the um, alignment to Schengen legislation. They familiarize themselves with the Schengen Aki with Schengen tools and novelties. The expert team has been uh, established uh, some years ago. It is composed mostly of Slovenian, Croatian, Slovakian and Austrian experts. This has proved to be a great added value to the Western Balkan countries because it is these countries that have the most recent and most relevant experience. The language barrier is minimal and uh, Croatia especially has the most recent experience. Since 2012, we have conducted several meetings of the task force. The Schengen self evaluation module was entered into full use and all parts have been completed. And uh, last year, we have successfully upgraded our efforts with the first field evaluation of border crossing points in the Western Balkan region based on Schengen evaluation standards, so EU procedure. And this year, in 2015, a second field evaluation is planned between 1st and 3rd of June on the border between Serbia and Bosnia. In the area of education and training, component two, we 
are trying to fulfill specific needs of police and border police practitioners as well as their trainers and educators to bridge the gap between theory and practice. We have utilized different approaches to, to um, achieve this. Since 2005, and we go all the way back to the beginning of the border security program, we have been strengthening their managerial capacities. The international courses for regional commanders and station commanders took place, but were discontinued in 2011. However, their modules, their contents have been used in the preparation of uh, some EU accredited uh, border management courses. And here I would like to especially emphasize the excellent cooperation we have had with the OSCE Border Management College in Dushanbe and Frontex, who implements the EU Master's Program for Border Guards. In 2012, we have established a network of institutions responsible for police education and training in the Western Balkan region. We have been conducting exchange programs. We are planning several bilateral exchanges for police practitioners and trainers uh, each year. And this includes our role in the facilitation of Western Balkan EU exchanges within the annual CEPO European Police Exchange Program. Last year, as many as 18 Western Balkan exchanges have taken place in the CEPO Exchange Program. And this year, we hope to see an even larger number. From last year on, we have been focusing mostly on specific training seminars and webinars for trainers to follow the so-called multiplication principle. We believe that in this way, the knowledge that we provide can be disseminated to many more persons and relevant target audience. And the webinar is a perfect example of that. And of course, in all our activities, we achieve important synergies with the PCC, with the efforts under the PCC Convention, which my, co my colleague will present later. I would also like to use this opportunity to announce the fourth DCAF Train the Trainers Summer Course to take place in Andermatt in Switzerland, as every year, uh, between 10th and 16th of August 2015. This is a week-long, very intensive training camp for, for professional educators and trainers in the security sector, so not only police, also military. It is financially supported by the Swiss Department of Defense. And uh, last year, for example, we had as many as 23 countries represented in this course, mostly from Southeast Europe, Central Asia, other OSCE countries, and of course, EU member states. The main focus of the topics of the learning topics in 2015 will be bridging the gap between theory and practice. Component three is called common and coordinated measures. This is increasing regional operational cooperation in response to current and occurring threats to regional security and border integrity. Our common operations have started in 2012. It was in November 2012 that the first common operation took place on the borders of the Western Balkan countries aimed to strengthen the security and integrity of the regional borders. The PCC Convention is used at the, as the common legal basis, and it is on this legal basis that the Western Balkan countries can send their representatives to work abroad, wearing their own uniforms, their own weapons. Our operations target illegal migration and specific forms of cross-border crime. They are used to share knowledge and practices between EU and non-EU practitioners working together on the same location. They help transfer EU good practices and Schengen standards. And of course, most importantly, they build mutual trust between colleagues from other countries. We also provide trainings on request and our operations are found to have a very positive impact on general local populations. They have achieved significant operational results, such as detected illegal border crossings, stolen vehicles, smuggling of goods, smuggling of humans, illicit drugs, forged documents, etc. And we have seen the participation of interested EU member states and EU agencies, Europol and Frontex. This year, these efforts in the area of operational cooperation are going to be upgraded 
with the first joint risk analysis for the Western Balkans on a regional basis, which was created early in 2015. Here on this slide, you can see the common operations and, and coordinated operations conducted since 2012. In 2015, we have already finished one common operation called Vardar. It was conducted on the border with Greece. It lasted uh, between 4th and 10th of May, but had to be concluded earlier, unfortunately, due to the security situation in the neighboring country. These are some of the media reactions to our operational measures. And here you can see eight border police officials working together in a common operation, meaning that they find themselves themselves um, on a, on this, in the same location, uh, wearing their own uniforms, so eight different uniforms, bringing them together has had great results, but it's a lot less easy than it looks. In the area of risk analysis and early warning system, we try to introduce the intelligence-led policing concept in the Western Balkan region. With our efforts, we try to complement existing capacities in the region for statistical analysis in order to enable them to assess the risks to their own border integrity and plan their, res their response accordingly. We have developed an application called the Border Sentry. It is a secure online application for data, non-personal data exchange, which can be used for statistical analysis and generating early warning messages later on. As already mentioned, at the beginning of 2015, we have developed the first regional risk analysis document. So a document outlining the risk to the Western Balkan borders. And of course, we try, we work hard to achieve full and complete complementarity with the Frontex risk analysis instruments. Between 2012 and until today, we have successfully developed and tested the border sentry application. Um, its full use will be possible after the signing of a multilateral implementing agreement based on the PCC convention. It is open to all 11 PCC contracting parties and expected to be signed in autumn 2015. We have also conducted several, several useful trainings on statistical analysis and tools. In the area of operational cooperation, there is another important aspect which has to deal with irregular migration management. Uh, it's important element called joint return. And here we mean joint return to extra-regional countries of origin. Uh, the Western Balkan countries have namely, namely been facing very pressing challenges with readmission and return to other third countries of origin. We have developed uh, this instrument based on EU good practices and standards with the significant contribution of Frontex, which, who participated with their um, experience and offered us great support. We prepared um, a multilateral agreement on joint, re joint return flights and an implementing protocol, which are also expected to be signed in the following months. Our partner in this effort, MARI, the regional initiative in Skopje, uh, has drafted for us a draft standard operational procedures, which was also required by the Western Balkan countries to bring joint return flights to realization in the near future. And from now on, synergies are going to be sought with the EPA regional action on ir irregular migration in the Western Balkans, administered by the European Commission and to be implemented by the main implementers, IOM and Frontex. I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions on the specifics of the program, please feel free to enter them into the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Ilka, for this very interesting presentation on the DCAF border security program. Um, now, before we continue with uh, colleague um, Katarina Lednik, I would just like to remind everyone uh, that you can post questions or save it for later when we will have a Q&A session. Okay, my colleague is ready, so I give the mic to her. Ladies and gentlemen, hello also from my side. My name is Katarina Lednik and I'm working as a project manager for the Secretariat of the Police Cooperation Convention for Southeast Europe. 
But before I begin with my presentation, I would like to ask you a question. I'm very interested in hearing what is your experience with the Police Cooperation Convention for Southeast Europe? So on the screen, you should already see the question and available answers. You can select one of the answers, which is either you know everything about the PCC, you are involved in PCC activities, you know what it is, but you do not use it in your work, you've heard about it, but do not know what it means, or you have never heard of it. So please select an answer. There's no right or wrong answer. So I see that majority of your answers are that you know what it is, but you do not use it in your work, or you've heard about it, but you do not know what it is. So I would go just a little deeper into analyzing your experience, and I would like to hear if you have ever used the PCC in your work. So how many of you are there? Please select one answer. Okay, so 8% of you use it in your daily work, 33% use it, but only during trainings and exercises, and 59% do not use it. So let's go briefly through the basics. What is the Police Cooperation Convention for Southeast Europe? From now on, I'm going to refer to the convention as the PCC. So it's a multilateral treaty ratified by 11 Southeast European countries and it therefore represents part of their national legislation. Why was it signed? Because the countries recognized that the only way to address serious crime issues impacting their region in a more effective and comprehensive way is to join efforts and work together on a basis of a common legal structure. It was signed first by the ministers of interior of the Western Balkan countries together with Moldova and Romania on 5th May 2006 during the Austrian presidency to the European Union. In the years to follow, four EU member states recognized the added value of the PCC, and so Bulgaria, Austria, Hungary, and Slovenia joined the PCC family. The PCC gives these countries a common legal basis for cross-border law enforcement cooperation, no matter their status of EU membership. As I mentioned, the main objective of the PCC is to effectively fight cross-border threats to public order and security and international crime. But having in mind that the PCC is a Schengen-like treaty, its full implementation will also help those countries not members of the European Union to accelerate their eventual accession. The focus of the PCC is on enhancing cooperation and information exchange. National central units have been established in the contracting parties and enable effective exchange of sensitive information in accordance with EU data protection safeguards. I'm happy to inform you that as of April 2014, all 11 contracting parties fulfill the data protection requirements arising from the PCC. This means that all 11 countries are now enabled to exchange information, including personal data. The PCC also includes a number of provisions to undertake and perform cross-border measures. For example, hot pursuit, cross-border surveillance, control deliveries, undercover operations, joint investigation teams, establishing common centers, exchanging DNA profiles and other identification materials, and conducting mixed patrols along state borders. The PCC is modeled on the EU acquis and best practice. The main activities that contribute to the full implementation of the PCC are based on three pillars. The first is the decision-making process, which is composed of the so-called Committee of Ministers and Expert Working Group. They are tasked to oversee the implementation of the PCC and take all necessary decisions and steps to advance the implementation. The second pillar is the implementation program. Here, the contracting parties are building their operational capabilities to meet challenges of cross-border cooperation. But the countries are not alone in this process. In 2008, the ministers decided that a secretariat of the PCC should be established. The Secretariat is a technical expert body that offers assistance to the contracting parties based on their needs and priorities. So the underlying principle is local ownership of the implementation process. That is why countries also take turn in chairing the convention. Currently, the chairmanship is in the hands of Hungary. 
The Secretariat is hosted by the Geneva Center for Democratic Control of Armed Forces at its regional office in Ljubljana, Slovenia. In addition, the contracting parties are strongly supported by Switzerland, the European Commission, as well as Liechtenstein, who provide financial support to make the country's participation possible in a number of activities throughout the entire year. These activities cover a wide range from expert meetings to study visits, cross-border exercises, training courses, capacity building workshops, and other meetings of PCC bodies. To give you an example of the broad types of activities and areas that are covered, for example, today and tomorrow, we are hosting experts on illegal migration who are working out the modalities for a joint action in the fight against illegal migration, which is planned to be performed in the end of June. Next week, we have a conference on fugitive active search teams in Belgrade and a meeting of the thematic working group on police education and training in Budapest. The convention can be seen as a toolbox for operational cooperation. So the aim of the first two pillars is to set framework conditions for the countries to fully use the PCC in their everyday work. As a novelty, I'm happy to inform you that the ministers have now given the secretariat a new task, which is also to support countries in the practical real life operations. So we are expecting to start receiving requests very soon. An important characteristic of the implementation is that it combines a top down and bottom up approach. This way, the flow of communication and express needs are brought to all levels, from ministers down to practitioners and vice versa. To support the cooperation in different areas of the PCC, the countries have established seven specific working groups and networks. They cover the fields of data protection, police education and training, exchange of information regarding forged and fake travel documents, cross-border surveillance, joint investigation teams, telecommunications and countering terrorism. But before I end and give the floor to our esteemed colleague and expert, Mr. Dushan Kerin, I would like to present you a few outstanding developments in the implementation. The contracting parties are successfully exchanging alerts on forged and fake travel documents. So far, over 250 alerts have been exchanged in this regard. I would also like to inform you that the contracting parties are in the phase of preparing for future automated DNA data exchange. They have already drafted the multilateral implementation agreement for this purpose. A police cooperation convention manual has been prepared to serve you as a guidebook for performing duties covered by the PCC. It is available on the homepage of the Secretariat. In 2014, the first region-wide cross-border exercise was performed under the umbrella of the PCC. Over 250 highly trained surveillance operatives engaged in the surveillance of 10 persons and over 100 messages were exchanged through the Europol Siena channel. Last year, we also concluded an, an EU Commission finance project on developing e-learning models. One of the three developed models is related to the area of data and information exchange, which is the main subject of today's webinar. The e-model is available on CPOL's platform, and you are all we warmly welcome to make full use of it. Dear colleagues, this was only a brief presentation into the complexity of the convention and its implementation process. That is why I would like to invite you all to visit our homepage for more information on the PCC. It's www.pccseesecretariat.si. There you can find all the meeting documents, important decisions taken by the ministers and the expert working group, as well as other interesting reading material. The PCC is available in all official languages of the contracting parties, as well as in English. For any further questions, Please use the chat box and feel free to call or email us at any time after this webinar. We are more than happy to assist you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katerina, for this very, very interesting presentation of the PCC. And now we have uh, slowly worked our way up to the main event of today's webinar, Information Exchange, which will be presented by Mr. Dushan Karin, former head of International Police Cooperation Division of Ministry of Interior of Slovenia and a contracted senior police advisor to the DCAF Ljubljana. So I give the floor to Dushan. Hello to everybody. 
Please allow me firstly to thanks DICAF to invite me to be able to exchange and share uh, information related to information exchange with all of you. And in the same time, I would like to thank all of you participating this uh, webinar. Before starting, I would like to uh, say that um, when we are speaking about information exchange, this is the core of the police business. When I mentioned uh, the information management, that means that each police officers on the daily basis, they are involved in the different types of work with the information or they are collecting information or they are analyzing it or processing or exchanging or disseminating. So different types. And as mentioned, this is a core thing of our daily basis. So what we would like to achieve during today webinar. Firstly, uh, we would like to present the tools, instruments and mechanisms for cross-border information exchange. Secondly, we would like to exchange experience this is related to the cross-border cooperation. And the last but not the least, it is uh, important that uh, we would like to achieve that all participants will become familiar with the basic channels for cross-border information exchange. Related to these objectives, I would like to invite you again, all of you, uh, that you could put the answer in the box for, for the answers. So you were already informed that you could use English, uh, Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian and Montenegrin language. And it would be a pleasure for me to answer you on your question. I would like to start firstly with a question you can see it on the screen and it is uh, defined as which instruments, systems and channels for cross-border information exchange are you familiar with? We put it a uh, different possibilities. There are much more of them, but we, we put it five of them and you are all invited to define not only one, you could put it all uh, these channels or systems or, or uh, tools for international and cross-border cooperation. As you can see, the possibilities are Interpol, Europol, Schengen Information System of Second Generation, CELEC, and Police Cooperation Convention for Southeast Europe. You have approximately one minute to decide which tools you heard about and you are familiar. Oh, I can see very interesting results. I, to be honest, I expected it regarding the fact that we are speaking in the Southeast region. The Interpol is most known tool. And uh, I'm a little surprised that also Europol with 60%, uh, it's quite uh, high. Uh, Interpol was 84% and uh, logically 42% Selec and uh, also 25% um, for police cooperation convention and the 20% of Schengen Information System uh, too, what is also logical regarding the fact that the CIS is not available yet in the region. Regarding the current situation on the field of information exchange, I would like to underline that for the end users uh, which are involved in information exchange, the most important things are that the data they will exchange will have high quality, that they will be exchanged very quick and the respo special ex response will be very quick and that there will be uh, respected security and uh, protection. When I'm speaking about the information, it is necessary to mention what we are mentioned under the information. So information are data which are processed, organized, structured, or presented in a given context. These are the data within the information uh, thing. So on the daily basis, law enforcement authorities exchange information for the different purposes. As you can see, for criminal investigation, preventing a crime, uh, public order, security, and also for some other purposes. Very important issue is for the training uh, part for, for the staff of the police and also other law enforcement authorities. 
also a uh, very important part is related to the uh, investigation uh, techniques in relation to detection of serious forms of organized crime. Within um, a lot of countries, there were different studies which reported that when they make a criminal investigation, at least one quarter of all of national investigations and criminal intelligence operations are related to cross-border information exchange. And even wider, they are related to international exchange of, of information among law enforcement authorities. Which are the purposes for the information exchange? Information exchange is, is the main police and intelligence tool in countering crime. It covered both written and oral form and can have urgent and not urgent character. The decision is taken according to each case in particular, but as a rule, information exchange must comply with a prerequisite form according to the channel used. From the praxis, I'm very familiar that a lot of information are still exchanged directly. So two, one police officers to another one not only in the national level, also cross-border and even wider. They exchange data using different tools. Main use tool is a phone, then email and some uh, so-called social networks. From quick response point of view, this is okay. But from legal point of view, this is quite problematic. From my experience, I know that uh, in all of your countries, in your legal basis, there are quite clear, defined regulations how data could and should be exchanged cross-border and on international level. And I'm quite sure that is also mentioned how the personal data should be exchanged uh, related to the data protection uh, issues. If not before, on the first step, when you will have a trial in the court, uh, usually the first question of the defense is how the police receive the data abroad. So if we use the phone, email, and uh, social network, this could cause us a serious problem from the legal point of view. Purpose for information exchange is that the information we are exchanged on the daily basis are essential tool for all law enforcement authorities. We already have a lot of bilateral and multilateral agreement related to the information exchange, but uh, nevertheless, and despite this, there are some different instruments and systems such as Interpol, Europol, SELEC, Schengen Information System, License Offices, available also as a tool for cross-border information exchange. What is important, it is that the data which are exchanged have a high level of security, that they are exchanged smooth and unsecure cross-border info exchange way. Also important is how the law enforcement agencies exchange this data so that they have tackled a common activities, common action, or so-called common standards, which were very important for officers involved in cross-border international uh, information exchange. And information which are exchanged are not related only on serious and organized crime. I already mentioned in the beginning that we exchange also other types of information which are important of our daily work. Data quality. When I'm speaking about the data quality, uh, I mentioned uh, the two things. It's the uh, content and the source. Which data are quality? Data are quality if they have the uh, following characteristic, that they are complete, that they are valid, accurate, consistent, available in time. These uh, characteristics are important for data quality. Data security. Data security refers to prevention unauthorized access to computers, databases, websites, 
Data security is also known as information security or computer security. Examples of data security technologies include software, hardware, disk encryptions, backups, data masking, and data eraser. And last but not least, very important part, becoming more and more important from year to year, it's data protection. Data protection is a form of respecting citizens' right of preserving their personal data and the lawful usage of such data in the processes of information exchange. Personal data can only be gathered legally under strict conditions for legitimate purpose. Furthermore, person or organization which collect and manage personal information must be protected from misuse and must respect certain rights of the data owners which are guaranteed by the national and EU law. All the citizens or all persons have a right to complain and obtain redress in their own data if they are misused anywhere, especially within the European uh, EU, this is a special rule. Very known is so-called EU Data Protection direct, uh, Directive, which also foresees special rules for the transfer of personal data outside of EU and to ensure the best possible protection of personal data when it is exported abroad. I'm quite sure that in all of your national legislation you have defined how and which rules are important and uh, obligatory for exporting of data uh, abroad. Now I would like to tackle to the tools or channels which are in uh, daily use for cross-border information exchange and uh, not only cross-border, also for international cooperation. First one is Interpol. Interpol it is the oldest and largest international organization for police cooperation. Last year, it was 100 year when Interpol was established in Monaco. So, um, under my knowledge, there is only post organization which is old, older in the, the in the world. So, a very important organization for the uh, police, not only the police, also for the other law enforcement agencies. This organization ensure and promote the widest possible mutual assistance. Why? Because 190 countries are the member of Interpol. What is important? The member of Interpol are not the countries. The police from these countries are member of Interpol, which is much more uh, essential. Information could be changed through databases. There are different databases uh, available uh, within the Interpol. This is um, one thing or through uh, bilateral information exchange using the so-called uh, Interpol channel I-24-7. What kind of data are within Interpol? You can find the data about the wanted persons, wanted vehicles, uh, lost and stolen, or stolen documents, or then you can find the data about the crimes in different categories, uh, drug captures, forged currency captures, stolen art, fingerprints of criminals, and so on and so on. And all these resources may be assessed by National Central Bureau of Interpol. And this is the contact point for each of country. For you as end user of the system, it is important to know where your National Center below is and which are contact data. Usually, and mostly, the central, National Center Bureau is within the Criminal Police Department. Europol. Europol is uh, European Union's law enforcement agencies. Their goal or target is to assist EU member states and other, also other member states in fighting against serious international crime and terrorism. It, this is done within the manner of so-called mandate that we have the crim criminal acts which are under the mandate of Europol and when uh, Europol should be contacted and involved. Main 
target, main objective of Europol is gathering, analyzing, uh, and disseminating of information because they have amazing tools for doing this uh, and providing these uh, services. There is also opportunity for Europol with their uh, headquarters in The Hague. I forgot to mention the headquarters of Interpol is in Lyon in France, of Europol is in The Hague. They could also coordinate different operation in the member states. Also, you could invite Europol experts and analysts to take part in joint in the investigation team. And communication with the Europol and the Hague is going through Europol National Unit. So same like the National Central Bureau of Interpol, also there is Europol National Unit, which is more or less usually in same unit or same department where you will find also your National Central Bureau of Interpol. Main, mainly this, this is in the so-called criminal police department, but this is the na national decision of the country. What is important to know uh, for uh, Interpol and Interpol is that Interpol staff in Lyon and Europol staff in Den Haag, they could not investigate crime themselves independently in your country. You can see uh, very often in the movies, especially in some action movies, that Interpol inspector or Europol inspector were involved in the, some investigation in the country, but that's not true. They are supporting national authorities providing all the services to the citizens. They have supportive role, not operational. When I may mention that you can invite Europol experts and analysts to take part, so they will support activities. They will not use coercion measures. Another tool or service is Schengen Information System of second generation. Uh, I saw from your questionnaire that you're not so familiar with it, but regarding the fact that all of member states in the Southeast Europe in the near future will become a part of EU, this will be obligatory part of your uh, daily work. And this tool will be in daily use for information exchange. Schengen information system of second generation is highly efficient large scale of IT system. It supports external border control and law enforcement cooperation enable member states to enter and consult certain categories of alerts and contact, contact office with other member states and office for exchanging of supplementary information is serene. Through serene offices, all the requests and the replies are going abroad and are incoming into the countries. If we are comparing Schengen Information System and Interpol Information System, which are comparable, we will find more or less very similar data and information. I, I could tell you that in this moment or in very near future in the Schengen Information System of the second generation, there will be around 100 million of different alerts. You can imagine this is a really, really huge amount. And we have different categories of alerts within. You will find the alerts related to the refusal of entry or stay, then persons wanted for arrest, missing persons, persons sought to assist with the judicial procedure, persons and object for discrete and specific checks, object for seizure or use as evidence in criminal procedures. Where are the differences between these two, two systems? For instance, in Interpol, you will find also the data about the forged currency, about the stolen art and about identified, unidentified bodies. For instance, in Schengen Information Systems, you will find more than stolen and missing vehicles. You will find also stolen airplanes, containers, vessels and in the industrial equipments. So, the possibility is much more uh, wider. And then SELEC, 
Selec uh, its South European Center for Combating Trans-Border Crime with the headquarters in Bucharest, Romania. Uh, their task is to coordinate regional operation and support investigations. They are on the daily basis, they are collecting, analyzing and disseminating information and criminal intelligence. And they are able to produce strategic analysis and treat assessment for the member states uh, involved. What is important uh, for the SELEC that we have the liaison bureau offices within the SELEC where we have a police officer liaison officers and custom liaison officers. So these en enable also to the customs to cooperate on the daily basis with their partners in the region, which is very important and amazing tool also. So we have also other instruments for cross-border uh, cooperation. Already mentioned today, PCC, a Police Cooperation uh, Convention for Southeast Europe, which is, under my opinion, more or less uh, copy-paste of the Schengen Convention. This is amazing tool for you to be ready and prepare for entering into the Schengen. Allows you to have daily contact with uh, all tools which are inserted into the Schengen Convention. And you will become familiar with all of this and you will be ready when it, the time will come to enter to the EU. License officers are a very important tool. They are, we are sending them abroad and they are providing us and supporting us uh, within the investigation and also other uh, police activities. Frontex, this is also an uh, important uh, police agency for uh, protection and uh, um, border control with uh, headquarters in Warsaw, in Poland. CIPOL is al also EU agency for the training and uh, uh, training issue uh, for the police and other law enforcement officers. And we have also other different opportunity which are defined within the bilateral and multilateral agreement related to the information exchange. Which are channels and communication tools from technical point of view? As you can see within the Interpol we have the system called I-24-7. Within the Europol we have Siena and Europol information system. Within the Schengen Corporation we have Schengen information system of second, second generation. We have also the tool for information exchange with the SELEC and we have some other channels. I already mentioned uh, some of them. Uh, license officers, this is also the channel for information exchange. For the technical point of view, it is a national decision how the license officers are equipped for information exchange. Um, but uh, from my knowledge and point of view and probably in the future the best tool for day, daily use could be Sienna system for information exchange. Which are most frequent channel in use? We were already able to see that in the region Interpol is the channel which are mostly in use. Uh, in, in the territory of EU, this is the Schengen Information System of second generation. So more or less 50-60% of information are exchanged through Schengen Information System of second generation. Then around 30% through Interpol and then 10% Europol and 5% uh, which uh, with uh, SELEC. But the percent, percentage it's different from country to country but general it is as I mentioned. There is also possibilities on so-called automated searches, which is uh, the future of so-called information exchange. These enable us to check different databases in uh, foreign countries under the so-called uh, tool PRUM, PRUM convention. This allows us that we could check on daily basis uh, fingerprints and uh, DNA data directly in the member states of EU, which already uh, implemented a PRUM decision. Uh, under my knowledge and experience, 
this could be done also within the Southeast Europe or region using PCC convention, uh, Southeast Europe as a, a legal uh, base and one of already existing challenges for information exchange like Interpol or, or Europol. When we are speaking about the synergy and interoperability, uh, it is important that if we have a lot of channels from practical point of view, for me as a policeman, I know from my background, I will use only one, which will be the quickest one, most effective and the fastest one. Because of this, it is important for the end users that the system will enable them through one checking through the national system in the on the beside of this system or on or in the background of the systems also other systems will make a check for instance i will check in the national system dushan kerin data and in same times this simultaneous check will go through interpol data and to the schengen data and i will receive only one reply on same screen this is the synergy and this is interoperability and this is also one of so-called best practices and recommendation uh, for for all of you choice of channel um, under my opinion for the end users this is not so important which channel should be in use but if it is very important for the staff and the people and officers which are working in the uh, divisions, uh, sections, department responsible for police cooperation, international or cross-border. In Southeast uh, Europe, these offices are known like ILCO offices. So they have different approaches or characteristics how to decide which channel will be used. One of them is so-called geographical approach. So if we have the nationality of person, then we will, if we will send it, for instance, in Burkina Faso, this is only the member of Interpol, so we will use the Interpol channel. Also, if we know the residents, we could much easier decide uh, which uh, country uh, we will send through which channel. Also, we, we have a phone number, fingerprints on DNA. It is important to know which data uh, base contain fingerprints and uh, DNA data. So we have Interpol database and Schengen database, which consist of this data. Then thematic approach. If we are investigating crime where more member states, two or more member states of Europol are involved and they are investigating crime within the mandate of Europol, we will use the Europol uh, channel. Also, we will use it related to confidentiality and sensitivity point of view. And this is one of the main rules. We will always use the channel for a reply, the same channel for reply through which we receive the request. And also we will use the channel related to the previous related requests. From the technical point of view, there is decision, for instance, the data related to the terrorism could be exchanged through so-called BDL system, which is secure channel. Also from uh, data availability point of view and uh, technical compatibility, Prum, we will use the channel we decided we will use it in, in this case and also Swedish initiative. These are two tools which are in this moment not so known in the Southeast Europe, but they will become more and more important on your daily uh, basis. Important uh, issue is also emergency character. So if we are doing cross-border operation, for instance, cross-border surveillance or hot pursuit, it is very important that we define in the early stage already which channel we will use it for information exchange. But as I mentioned in the beginning, this should be concern of the offices responsible for information exchange cross-border international so-called ILCO offices. Not only police information are exchanged through police daily work, 
we are exchanging also judicial judicial information regarding the fact that there are quite a lot of alerts issued by the judicial authorities we are exchanging a lot of information related to these alerts regarding the fact that the criminal justice process involves also law enforcement and judicial authorities not only only police very important issue it is uh, mutual legal assistance when the information is needed uh, as evidence in the procedure so we need to exactly to know uh, if we can use a tool for international police cooperation or it is necessary to use a mutual legal assistant tool which could be performed only by judicial authorities this is important for all end users that they exactly know in their own countries which requests should be sent to police cooperation and which request should be done only to mutual legal assistant or through judges or to the prosecutors depends of the legal uh, legal basis in your own country despite the fact that mutual legal assistant usually is sent through the secure channels of ministry of foreign affairs they also use the channels of international police cooperation for instance if we have international arrest warrant and the person is arrested in our country and uh, our judicial authorities exchange information judicial one related to this person about uh, his extradition they could use also the police channel but only as a channel for information exchange from the legal point of view all the data should be sent to the ministry of foreign affairs but i already mentioned this should be reg regulated in the national legislation and uh, the last but not least it, important one when, is when we are exchanging the information it is necessary to define if uh, this data by are owned by judicial authorities of country they allowed to disseminating this data and to use it in the processes so to clearly define if the data are only for police or only for judicial use or both for police and judicial use this is very important issue uh, in the end i would like to share with you so-called uh, single point of contact philosophy these are uh, the services for international police cooperation so in the smallest uh, circle dark blue we have so-called front office 24 7 service uh, duty officers which are responsible for all incoming and outgoing requests related to the information exchange with an urgent manner if it is something uh, complicated or something uh, more related to the so-called back offices and there is needed some additional task to be done or even more it should be sent uh, in some other authorities within the police or out of the police uh, front office will contact so-called back offices these back offices are in the second circle which is a little bigger you can see these are staff and offices which are working in national central bureau of interpol of europol national unit of select contact point and within the serene office re office responsible for communication with schengen information system of second generation uh, within the division department or any other unit responsible for international police cooperation we had also uh, bilateral liaison officers we have legal or strategic unit and uh, there is also possibility to have international police operation and uh, something similar and so-called supporting supporting services like that data protection help desk translation offices so all these services are responsible for supporting of information exchange within the country for all the end users when i'm speaking about the end users i have in mind border police officers investigators also the law enforcement agencies out of the police like a customs officers and uh, other officers 
within the Ministry of Finance, like a finance police or something similar. From my experience, if we want to see how our system is functioning, it is the same question if we ask ourselves how front office is fun functioning. Because front office is 24 7. I could uh, declare that uh, during the morning till five o'clock, more or less all the services from National Police Corporation are functioning very well. But usually after five or let me say at 10 o'clock in the evening, when the people from the back offices are going home, then we will see if we have the system for International Police Corporation. So if our front office is able to receive to organize, to analyze, and to disseminate all the requests incoming and outgoing. outgoing. And this is a very important issue. Why we need a front office? We need it because of this, that the services from abroad, they could send it all requests only to on one point. We could not afford ourselves that the requests will come in Interpol box, Europol box, and it will wait at least one day to the morning that the people will come in the office or if we have holidays two three days especially if uh, the, a request will have emergency character training uh, it is a very crucial issue and in my opinion it is necessary within all the member states or countries they should have national curriculum related to the information system Usually this is done within the police academy and it is very important to involve the offices responsible information uh, exchange to be a part of providing of training. Then another tool very important is CPOL. CPOL is providing amazing tools for information exchange. I would like to inform you all and that within the CPOL you will find also a program prepared by DECAF related to the information exchange and all of you are invited to visit CIPOL site and to see this program which could help you on your daily work. Important tool is also the Police Cooperation Convention Southeast Europe. I'm convinced that this part should be even extended because I'm quite sure that this moment in the member states is, is not so familiar yet it should be extended in much more let me say general level it should be much more precisely defined to the all the end users that exist what can offer you how could use it this is very important and what is most important to show that all the offices responsible for international and cross-border police cooperation, so-called ILECUS, are involved in PCC activities. Webinar, you can see from your experience today that this is very important and very useful, uh, useful tool because uh, you can stay in your office, you could participate, uh, your authority will spend some money and there will be no need to send anybody abroad uh, and especially for administration this is very good tool e-learning if you have possibility to establish e-learning in your platform of your police academy and or other platforms this is even more amazing tool i know from our experience in slovenia we use this tool in our training system within uh, our police academy which enable us to, to put uh, the program related to the information exchange. And even more, what is becoming more and more important, we could include some testing of the participants, which is also amazing. Now, in the end, I would like to invite you all to see the statements I prepared in the end of the presentation you could agree or disagree so you are all invited to put yes or no uh, all these statements are related to the information exchange i put it based on my knowledge and they are also related uh, about the experience 
within some working groups of EU, uh, they already made some analyzed related to the information exchange. So first statement is that information exchange generally works well. So you could agree or disagree. Then another one or second one. So you have, I would like to invite you first to agree or disagree with the first statement. So I can see that most of you, 92% uh, agree with, with my statement and 8% disagree, which I respect. Then uh, statement number two. No new law enforcement database or information exchange instrument are needed at this stage. So we already have a lot of databases I already mentioned, Interpol, Schengen Information System, Europol. The statement is that we don't need new databases. So you are invited also to agree or disagree. Um, most of you, 75% agreed with this statement and 25% uh, disagree, which I also respect. Uh, statement number three. So this statement is related to the statement before. The existing instruments could and should be better implemented. So you are now invited also to agree or disagree about this statement. So here we are, we are quite close to 100%, it's 98% you agree and 2% disagree. Statement uh, number four related to previous one, the exchange of information should be organized more consistently. Very similar, so better implemented, organized more consistently. You are also invited to agree or disagree with this statement. Very similar like the previous one, 96% agreed with the statement and the 4% uh, disagree. And the last one, which is related to the statement or the question I raised in the beginning of the webinar, and it is a for formulated like, a need exists to ensure high data quality, quick response, security and protection. These are expectations of all involved information exchange. So you could agree or disagree with this. You're also invited to decide for this last statement. Thank you very much for all of you participating in this part. For the last statement, 94% uh, uh, agreed and 6% uh, disagreed. So generally, I could say that you more in more than 65% agreed in all the statements related to this presentation or to this part related to the information exchange. I would like to thanks to all of you to participating to the webinar. You were already invited to raise a questions. You are invited still. It will be a pleasure for me to sharing a knowledge with you. Here are my contact details. If you have any questions, if you agreed or disagree with something, it will be a pleasure for me to communicate with you. I would like to wish you a successful work. I would like to all to you that you become familiar with the, all the tools related to the information exchange regarding the fact that information exchange, it is most important issue for the police officers on a daily basis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dushan, for this very insightful presentation on information exchange. I'm sure that everybody uh, learned a lot. Um, now, as we said, you will have an opportunity for your Q&A session. So what you are invited to do is put your questions in the chat shout box or the question shout box, whichever is shown on your bottom right side of the screen. But while you do this, uh, we are already receiving a couple of questions, which is very nice, but I will ask Dushan. So Dushan, you mentioned that, well, we live in the age today of the social media and all these um, social channels. Does the information flow also through those channels? And if yes, what, what 
are the reasons, I'd say benefits of it, but then again, uh, what are the shortcomings? Thank you. I mentioned this uh, during my presentation that so-called social tools for exchanging of data and mobile phones are useful on a daily basis. I mentioned that this is from practical point of view, this is okay. And the police officers, they are doing this in the, the daily manner. But from the legal point of view, it's very problematic. From the legal point of view, it's problematic because on the in the national legislation, I'm quite sure, I'm familiar with the legal legislation in Southeast Europe that is very precisely defined how the data could be exchanged abroad, especially personal data. Also, in the data related to the to the data protection is very precisely defined how and in which manner the data could be exchanged and i'm quite sure that uh, the email mobile phones are not in use for such a purpose okay you could exchange the data some urgent data on some activities you will start it you will finish it you will continue and something similar but when you will transfer personal data and personal de details which will be used in investigation then official channels should be in use and even more my recommendation is if you are using this tool so if you are exchanging data through email please inform your central authority for police cooperation to be familiar with data exchange Thank you very much for this uh, explanation. Now we are receiving quite a few questions. So what we will do is we will select a couple of them, read them out loud so that everybody will know what we're talking about. But to reassure everybody, yes, this presentation, this webinar will be made available on DCAF uh, Ljubljana website, also on the PCC. So in case you missed something, make sure to go back and check it out. Once we made a few tweaks to it, it will be published on the web. Dushan, I will just stay with you now because I have you behind the mic. There are a couple of questions that we have and you can select a couple of questions. Okay. There are the questions related to the training. Um, for instance, there is the questions, which e-learning platform does Slovenian Police Academy use? I know that this is the question more related to the, our police uh, academy uh, because I, I was only the end users of the platform but it is a platform which was defined within our police academy and which is in the use for all law enforcement agencies. And I should inform you or share with you that the um, Division for International Police Cooperation was one of the first which prepared, prepared e-learning model for cross-border police cooperation related to cooperation within the Interpol, Europol and the Schengen. And we have specialized training in the same platform uh, for the, all the end users related to the Schengen information system of the second generation, which enable us to transfer the knowledge on the widest possible way. And there are not only possibility, uh, within this platform, it was also the obligation for all the participants to pass through these models to go through the tests and there are even decision in which percentage the answer should be repeated. If the percentage was not uh, suitable, it was necessary to repeat. And the uh, management was then informed about each participants, how he passed, when he passed and so on. And we also allow them and uh, transfer them with the all necessary knowledge and information to pass the test. We are getting quite a few more questions um, and unfortunately we are a bit pressed for time, but what we will do is we will organize them and also send them in, e in email to all of you participants, all of the questions gathered, so you will receive your answers, not to worry. Um, but Dushan, we still have one extremely interesting. Can a country refuse to give information to another country on the person whose fingerprints or DNA match. So can a country refuse to give this information? So if we are speaking about the bilateral information exchange, this is defined within the national legislation, in which cases member states could refuse to give the information to another country. 
because we have in our legislation defined uh, different databases and within each of databases for instance of dna databases uh, the national legislation should very precisely define how this information could be shared who could have access and if we could send this data abroad in what manner from from decision point of view, the things are, let me say, a little more precise because PRUM, as an EU uh, legal binding act, define the way of information exchange and the activity after the hit. So when the authorities responsible for matching informed the central authorities which are responsible for data exchange, these things are, let me say, in PRUM decision very precisely defined. Okay, we seem to be experiencing a bit of a technical difficulties, so I hope that you can hear us now. I'm not sure what's going on, but don't worry. We will provide you, like I said, with the answers to all these questions also in the follow-up. So what we can do now is give on one more question. So is the application, the border sentry, active and who can use it? Yelka? Thank you. Uh, the border sentry application is active. It has been tested, but it, it cannot be used for operational purposes at this moment. We were expecting to sign the multilateral agreement between five Western Balkan countries already last year, but there was some delay in the national adoption procedures, governmental procedures, in order to obtain the minister's mandate to sign. However, we expect this to be signed in September at the latest. Uh, this platform is secure. It can be accessed only by authorized representatives of the border police forces. The aim is, in the long term, to make it accessible to all levels of the border police. So not just central units for risk analysis, but also local levels, police stations levels. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yelka, for this explanation. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for participating at today's webinar. We've had quite a, an amazing turnout, actually, for, with participants from Lithuania, Greece, France. So you can see that the, the outreach of this webinar, this type of tool is very useful, comes handy and has a wide reach. So for us, it has been quite an interesting experience and we hope that you will also join us on some other webinars that we will be doing in the second half of the year. Special thanks go also to all the speakers today, Dushan, especially to you. And I would kindly ask that you please stay online just a bit longer and provide us on your thoughts on this webinar and also your suggestions on what you would like to hear in the future. So on behalf of the speakers, DCAF team and myself, thank you and have a nice remainder of the day. Goodbye.